Justin Brierly, host and creator of the Unbelievable podcast and YouTube channel, has a video called Why, After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian. As an atheist myself, I have some concerns about Justin's arguments and about his listening skills. Justin Brierly is still a Christian because he thinks Christianity is the best explanation for three things. Human existence, human value, and human purpose. We've already discussed some issues with how Justin approaches these conversations, so now let's talk about the first thing Justin thinks is best explained by Christianity, human existence. God makes sense of human existence. I'm sorry to interrupt so soon, but... If humans simply invented the idea of God, then of course they would make it compatible with this most basic fact that humans exist. The real question is, can we infer anything from the idea that God made humans? Does this explanation make any useful predictions? And is there anything we might discover which you would count as evidence against the idea that God made humans? Or... No matter what we discover about ourselves, no matter how stupid our design might be, are you just going to say, well, I guess God just wanted it that way? I think you will. Don't try to pretend you won't. This is why God is a bad explanation. But I already said this in part one, so let's just keep going. Being a human is pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, when you look at ourselves, it, we are extraordinary. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt again so soon, but... We are not very extraordinary. We seem extraordinary today, but only because we've had tens of thousands of years to stockpile knowledge. Humans, in the raw, so to speak, without any sort of education or cultural background, are not very different from other primates. We are only good at math, for example, because we spend a large portion of our lives being taught math based on thousands of years of small accumulations. On our own, we are remarkably bad with numbers. Likewise, we are only good at logic because, as with math, we've been taught logic. And even then, there are still many people who couldn't reason their way out of a paper bag. Even our moral character and our capacity to desire the good of the other, which Christian apologists love to hold up as unique human trophies which prove our special creation, are clearly visible in other animals. Rats, for example, will go out of their way to free other rats from confining cages with no promise of reward. And birds will share food with other birds who have none. In this respect as well, humans are not actually extraordinary. As one final observation about how not-so-extraordinary humans are, the father of modern taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus, a deeply religious Christian, could not honestly avoid the conclusion that humans are primates as he set out to classify animals. In an admirable act of intellectual honesty, he had to admit that humans are primate animals. Special in spirit, he might argue, but primate animals nonetheless. Humans are not so extraordinary that their existence cries out for an extraordinary explanation. When you look at ourselves, it, we are extraordinary. And if you look into the data and the medical stuff and the science, it's just extraordinary how complicated and extraordinary our bodies are. Well, sure, our bodies, like the bodies of most animals, are very complicated. But complexity is not how we detect design, as I discussed in my video on the teleological argument. When we notice a watch lying on the ground, we don't infer that it was designed because it is complex, but because we are familiar with the form and materials. If we merely noticed, for example, a round piece of glass, as might be on the face of such a watch, we would still infer that it was designed, even though it's not complex. Complexity is not what indicates design. And one of the most extraordinary things I learned is the way the universe is set up in the most extraordinary way to produce you and me. In case Justin's cursory mention of the teleological argument wasn't super convincing, he's now going to explain the fine-tuning argument, an argument which, I believe I showed in my two videos on the subject, relies on unproven assumptions and ultimately proposes what amounts to a massive argument from ignorance. We don't have a particular naturalistic explanation, therefore, it was God. 
I've tried to condense a big idea into a short video. It's something called the fine tuning of the universe for life. So I'm going to let the video do the talking for a couple of minutes. Before anyone says anything, yes, I agree that it's weird for him to be playing a video of himself talking when he's already on stage talking. Some people say that human existence is a result of a roll of the cosmic dice. Like the gambler who stakes his life savings on the next throw, we just got lucky in the lottery of life. Okay, this is just disingenuous. I think Justin knows full well that he has never heard an atheist say that the universe is the way it is because of random chance on a uniform probability distribution. The most we can say at this time is, we don't know why the universe is the way it is. We have many different cosmological models in which a universe like ours would emerge, but we don't know which one, if any, is the correct one. This is not the same thing as saying, we think the universe is the way it is because of random chance. This is something I would expect Justin to have picked up on if he was actually listening during these past 10 years. By Justin's logic, before we knew that the Earth formed by the gravitational attraction of rocks in space, a person could have argued that, because we don't know how the Earth formed, therefore, it must have been random chance. And man, what are the chances that it would randomly be a sphere, instead of any of the other epistemically possible 3D shapes, like a cube or a pyramid or something? And what are the chances that all the Earth's materials just randomly arrange themselves from densest to lightest? That's impossibly unlikely. It must have been God! Big Bang! When our universe began to rapidly expand, the rate of that expansion was exquisitely finely balanced. Any faster, and the universe would have expanded too rapidly to allow the formation of chemicals, atoms, stars and galaxies. Any slower, and the universe would have collapsed back in on itself. But as it happens, the universe expanded at just the right rate to allow for life to develop in the future for us to be here. It hit 70 rolls of the number six in a row, first time. Actually, fun fact, Justin, the theoretical physicist, Sean Carroll, who you've had on your show, explained why this is false to William Lane Craig back in 2014. The fine tunings that you think are there might go away once you understand the universe better. They might only be apparent. There's a famous example that theists like to give, or even cosmologists who haven't thought about it enough, that the expansion rate of the early universe is tuned to within one part in 10 to the 60th. That's the naive estimate back of the envelope pencil and paper you would do. But in this case, you can do better. You can go into the equations of general relativity, and there is a correct, rigorous derivation of the probability, and when you ask the same question using the correct equations, you find that the probability is one. All but a set of measure zero of early universe cosmologies have the right expansion rate to live for a long time and allow life to exist. I can't say that all parameters fit into that paradigm, but until we know the answer, we can't claim that they are definitely finely tuned. Now, to be fair, as far as I know, Sean Carroll did not make this point on Justin's show. But I think it behooves Justin to at least acknowledge that the atheists he's spoken to don't just say, well, it's technically possible, so I'm just going to believe we got lucky. Heard the dirt, there ain't no god. And the expansion rate of the universe is just one among 30 or so other incredibly sensitively finely tuned constants and fundamental forces in the universe that must be just the way they are for the universe to be able to produce us. All right, I'm just going to skip over the rest of the fine tuning argument because I've already made a video about it. Suffice it to say, our current levels of ignorance about how these properties of the universe depend on each other and what their probability distributions might look like, in addition to the unknowable probability of God existing given the fact of our universe, and what God's motivations might be, all mean that we cannot make a meaningful comparison of probabilities between theism and naturalism on this topic. This means that the fine-tuning argument can't even get off the ground. One person got in touch with me. They'd been someone who'd been struggling with their faith, but this video seemed to put a few things together for them. And they actually sent me a picture of their wrist and they'd had a dice tattooed on their wrist to remind them that they're not here by chance. For a lot of people, this is the way in. Science isn't something that disproves God. There are all these ways in which I think what we know about science isn't pointing away from God. It's pointing towards God. 
Yeah, the funny thing is, Justin, even young Earth creationists make this same basic assertion. Oh, science isn't against my faith, no. Science actually supports my faith. But only if I explain it in this vague, high-level way, and only if I ignore this other thing because that's not real science, and let's ignore that other finding because it speaks against my faith, but science is totally on my side. And if some atheist wants to point out that the entropy of the early universe is lower than it needed to be for life to exist by a factor of 10 to the 10 to the 120th power, which really undercuts the idea that the universe was made for life, just don't talk about it and repeat the assertion that science is totally on your side. Every version of every religion tries, at some point in its existence, to contort itself to fit the science, or to contort the science to fit itself. So forgive me if I don't take this claim very seriously, Justin. Biologically, we have this extraordinary DNA within us that seems to speak of some kind of a creative force behind it. As I explained in my video on the teleological argument, no it doesn't. Useful genes can arise spontaneously through the process of natural selection, with no author intelligently writing them. We've seen this in both a laboratory setting, where a virus evolved a completely novel protein coat from a random stretch of DNA, and in nature, where a species of bacteria evolved a new gene that allowed it to digest nylon. I could talk about the, the Big Bang, the fact that somehow time, space, energy, and matter all appeared suddenly 14 billion years ago. I mean, who set that off? Yes, Justin, because if you look at the research on early universe cosmology, and if you actually listen to the physicists on your own show, the burning question they are trying to answer is, who set that off? Come on, Justin, you know that this is question begging, and you know that this is not how physicists approach early universe cosmology. You've had them on your show. This is something that Sean Carroll had to explain ad nauseum to William Lane Craig in their debate, and I'm sure he would have explained it to you if only you'd bothered to ask. Anyway, that's enough about the fine-tuning and cosmological arguments. What else you got, Justin? So I think when it comes to making sense of human existence, God is the best explanation. Yes, I know you keep saying that, but God is not a good explanation, because it requires a ton of completely ad hoc assumptions. Why would such a being create anything in the first place, especially if it's supposed to be perfect already? Why would it create other minds rather than just cool rock formations? Why would it make a universe which doesn't contain most of the thing it was supposedly made for, that is, life? Why would it fine-tune the universe when it could have instead made a robust universe? Every answer to these questions requires a completely new ad hoc assumption about God. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all. So can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. God is not a good explanation. I don't think atheism has a great explanation for this, because if we're just here by chance, well, we already saw the odds are stacked massively against that. That doesn't make sense as an explanation of why we're here. As I said in part one, atheism does not need an explanation, any more than ancient non-believers in Zeus needed an explanation for lightning in order to justify not believing in Zeus. That's not how these conversations work, Justin. That being said, it just so happens that there are many plausible cosmological models of our universe which don't rely on some kind of god. We don't yet know if any one of them is the correct model, but to say that atheism doesn't have a good explanation is not only a blatant attempt to shift the burden of proof, it's factually wrong. And that's it. That's why Justin Brierley thinks God is the best explanation for human existence. As I think I've now shown, Justin's argument is little more than a high-level gish gallop of the teleological argument, the fine-tuning argument, and an argument from incredulity about just how amazingly complex humans are. Suffice it to say, God is not the best explanation for human existence. It's not even a good explanation for human existence. I'm sure that the atheists he's had on his show have told him these very basic things before, 
but it doesn't matter if you don't listen to them. That's all for part two. Make sure you fine-tune your subscriptions and notification settings so you don't miss part three.